back to Apocalypse here for another in brief video. Before we get started on this one, I just wanted to announce, I post this on Twitter as well, that we have started our Apocalypse here Patreon. So if you're interested in supporting the channel and supporting what we do, head on over to patreon.com slash apocalypse here. There'll be a link in the description and you can see all of the different benefits in each tier that we have there. Um, things from early access to pre-recorded Apocalypse Here videos, um, weekly book recommendations, uh, videos that are just for patrons, and you'll get prior prioritized input on future videos and blog posts as well. Um, as you move up the tiers, there'll be bi-weekly blog posts on topics having to do with theology, New Testament, and broader sort of social political issues, uh, monthly happy hour live stream hangout and Q&A, and then as you keep moving up, you can have access to being a guest on Apocalypse here to talk about a topic of your choice. So check out all the different benefits of each tier. And if you would like to support the channel, that would be awesome. So here's our public page. You can take a look at that on your own time. So in the last video, we gave a much more positive account of Israel and how Paul re-narrates the history of Israel um, it got to a point where we were talking about God's unconditional and irrevocable commitment to God's people, Israel, even with the inclusion of pagans who do not have to follow Jewish practices. An issue that comes up there is that there seem to be judgment texts and harsh texts in Paul that seem to suggest that some people in, are in and some people are out. Um, so we're going to need to handle the judgment question. And along the way, we're going to get a sense of further how Paul understands Israel and Israel's relationship to that judgment. At times, Paul does appear to see the future working out differently in relation to two distinct groups. Uh, the chosen get saved and they're marked by the spirit. And on the last day, they'll be resurrected and glorified. Um, those still alive get transformed and taken up by God. In Paul's earliest letters, he suggests that the rest of humanity will be destroyed by a fiery cataclysm. At this time, early on, he believed that they, the rest of humanity, who aren't going to be raised, along with sin, death, Satan, and the flesh, would eventually be annihilated. So 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1. But this is not all that Paul has to say about judgment. And thankfully, he didn't stop writing in the early 40s of the common era. But by the time we get to 1 Corinthians, which Paul likely wrote in the spring of 51 CE, just over a decade of missionary work since writing the Thessalonian correspondence, he gives us a picture of the final reckoning that has developed since his first letters. He still has cl two classes of people being judged, but they're not constructed in terms of saved or destroyed. Rather, he says that there will be people saved in and through the work that they built, and those saved by way of a fiery destruction of that work. So. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. If the work that someone has built endures, that one will receive a reward. If anyone's work should be burned away, that one will suffer loss, yet shall be saved, even as through fire. This seems completely in harmony with what the prophet Malachi prophesied about in terms of ref a refining fire. The fires of God's love and mercy, which will likely cause incredible pain, are not for the purpose of ultimate destruction, but for refinement, purification, and eventually eternal life with God. This new life with God is what the fiery judgment is aimed toward. If Paul means us to understand that there's yet another group destined for annihilation, he doesn't say so. In fact, that would not make any sense in the context of Paul's argument here. Furthermore, if Paul really believed in some sort of lasting division at this point between saved and doomed, it seems fairly careless, if not downright cold-hearted, of him to have omitted any mention of it to his community in Corinth he would, in fact, be setting them up for potential destruction. Now, my friend Andrew Rilera, who's a professor of biblical studies and theology at the King's University, deals really concisely with other judgment texts, like those found in 1 Corinthians 6 and 11, Galatians 5, in his on-script interview. So I'll refer you to that if you have any interest in those texts. I'm just not going to kind of get in the way of um, someone who explains it better and who's doing work on that. 
the link for that is in, in the description and he'll have this sort of stuff on atonement and judgment uh, coming out in print in the coming years. I think right now the book is called Lamb of the Free. One brief conclusion that we can draw from all of this is that Paul has slightly shifted his position on judgment. Over the course of the 11 or so years since writing First and Second Thessalonians, it appears that Paul changed his mind. And we have access to this adjustment through the Corinthian correspondence. We who are listening may hesitate um, to take on board this idea that Paul shifts in his understanding because possibly of a certain understanding of inerrancy and infallibility of, of the scriptures. And this can be appreciated, but the idea that Paul changes his position does not mean we just throw out scripture for being inconsistent or something like that. On the contrary, I think Paul's adjustment is a wonderful window in, into how his own discipleship changed. And I think we should embrace that. While he was forming communities that would eventually flourish, Paul himself was growing and changing too. And this really shouldn't surprise us. Now, after several years of missionary experience and encounters, it appears that Paul now sees that all people, Jews and pagans alike, will be entering the age to come, even if it is excruciatingly painful for some. So we are quite fortunate to have so many of his letters that show such developments, uh, maturations, and also unwavering consistencies and points of continuity especially the point of continuity, which is the risen Lord Jesus himself. But does this mean that we humans simply have no agency in relation to judgment and salvation? Are we just forced to choose God or something like that? Uh, no. It is possible, entirely possible though, for people to push this arrangement away, however destructive or irrational that rejection might be. As any loving parent would know, it's quite possible for a child to refuse a covenantal and loving arrangement. When people reject this arrangement and turn away, then they, for the time being, lose certain benefits of living in them, right? This, however, doesn't mean that a contract or a condition has snuck its way in. It is just the reality of consequences. So I am a son of two parents. Um, I love them very much. They love me unconditionally. At times, um, I know I've done things that have deeply grieved them. I've rejected their love, refused their generosity, and have said things to them that I wish I had never said. But I'll never, ever not be their son, and they will never, ever not be my father and mother. Nothing I can do will ever change the fact that I am their child and they are my, and they are my loving parents. The covenant is still in place. I can reject and abuse it, and I should respond to that appropriately, and in doing so, stop damaging myself and the people I love. But I, I cannot change the fact that I am in a covenant with them. And don't forget, there is nothing more judgmental than a loving and caring parent. This is where accountability is so strict in the quest for honesty, very sustained in deeply loving and committed family relationships. Is there going to be wrath and judgment? Absolutely. But it is the correct sort of wrath and anger. It's not retributive or contractual or conditional but it's controlled by the love of God revealed in Christ, an anger aggrieved and affronted by the abuse of a loving relationship. So as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, for all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may receive recompense for what we have done in the body, whether good or evil. So that's from 2 Corinthians 5.10. We are all held accountable without exception, but God responds to this scenario in the right sort of way, restoratively. God's judgment is a loving, firing anger that never lets go or gives up on the object of its grief. The fact then that many Jewish people in Paul's day were not responding positively to Jesus and courting the consequences does not mean that they're suddenly in a contract with God, that we sort of flipped out of covenant and into contract. They're still in a covenant, an irrevocable covenant. And that's why the rejection is so acutely painful and incomprehensible for Paul when he says in Romans 9, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, end quote, for his kindred who have not yet confessed Jesus. So that's from 9.2. Now, in the light of Paul's account of judgment, we need to know more about his understanding of the implications of God's covenant and loving commitment to humanity, especially Israel. We know that covenants can be violated, but not broken. But does God's relentless, committed, and loving judgment overcome human resistance in the end? So not only does Paul shift significantly concerning judgment from his earliest letters to the Thessalonians to the Corinthian correspondence, but as we're going to see in the next video, um, when he writes Romans in the spring of 52, 
he has moved even further toward endorsing the emphatically universal scope of salvation. Okay. God's unwavering love is revealed in Christ. He believes will finally triumph. So we're going to get into Romans 9 through 11 in the next video and continue on talking about judgment, continue on talking about um, Israel, this time in the future, what's going to happen. Um, are they going to be cut off or are they going to ultimately and finally be saved? And how does that relate uh, to the rest of humanity? Can this logic be extended? So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, um, our Patreon has started, patreon.com slash apocalypse here. So go there, check out all the, the benefits from the different tiers, and it'd be awesome if you could be one of our patrons. Um, please like and subscribe to the channel. And with that, this has been Apocalypse Here, Christianity You Can Live With. <laughs>